Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today, we are joined by Boston University Mac Master Lecturer John Day. John has been involved in research and development of computer networks since 1970, when his group at the University of Illinois was the 12th node on the ARPANET, and has also developed and designed protocols from everything from the data lay or the data link layer to the application layer. Today, he will be presenting How the Hell Do You Lose a Layer? So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, John, and I'm going to let you take it from here. This talk originated some years ago uh, in my, during my quest to figure out how we got where we are. We really need to know how we got here in order to know where we need to go next. And so I'm going to try and stay away from as much of the history as possible. But there are a lot of myths out there, and I will need to sort of dispel a few of them and sort of get the, you know, and there's some interesting early results that um, you probably aren't aware of. Um, so, um, you know, let's start and figure out where this, how this whole internet work stuff started. Um, as uh, we just said, as you, and as you probably all know, you know, things started with the ARPANET. And um, the ARPANET was the first packet switching network to be built. You all know that probably. And the whole idea was to do resource sharing. ARPA figured that they could lower the cost of research if people, they didn't have to buy big computers for every site on the, that everybody they were funding. And so, um, you know, and, and there was also stress the idea that it was a heterogeneous uh, network. And um, so, you know, there in 1970, 71, there were 12 to, oh, in those first few years, I should say, it, it was all planned. There were probably 12, over 12 different operating systems and machine architectures on the net. There were also places that were supposed to be compute centers, as well as places that were supposed to be database storage centers. But you know the ARPANET was really the first one, and as you probably know, BBN was uh, building the subnet, and it what they came came up with was actually very good for a first attempt. Um, necessarily, it was somewhere between a traditional datacom network and a new packet switch network. Um, but there, there were no layer diagrams at this point. Uh, in fact, I have even checked with the, the guy who was in charge of developing the, the switches, and they, they didn't do that. Now, layers, as you may well aware, came about in 1968 when Dijkstra pu published his paper on the uh, THE operating system, and it really captured everyone's imagination. I mean, people really sort of, you know, glommed onto this really all, of, all at once. Because in those days, elegance and the power of a solution mattered much more than it does today. And this really seemed to have, it was an elegant solution as most of the extras were. Now, this, as I said, were not really necessary for the, for the subnet because of, of how simple it was and what they were doing. It wasn't all that simple, but it was, you know, um, no, really. But the first thing, you know, that was necessary was, you know, when they brought the hosts on board, that changed considerably. And of course, since interfacing hosts to the network was something new. I mean, none of these computers had ever been developed to talk to a network. And there was a real question about how to do this. So the first thing we had to do was a device driver. And, you know, that was the imp to host protocol. And even just recently, Steve Rocker noted that one of the first things that he started thinking about when we were getting in, into this was, what were people doing with inter-process communication? What could they tell us about that? Because it was clear that that was the problem we had here. And they were going to build a resource sharing network. And then on top of that, uh, that IPC facility, we would have terminal drivers and uh, file transfer and all the usual things that an operating system would have. And that was, that was all going along quite well. And very quickly, we all began to live on the net. Um, it was, it was amazing how fast that happened, but you know, very quickly there were new ideas coming from Europe. 
and there was some really interesting stuff going on. Soon after the ARPANET was operational, Louis Pazan visits the U.S. Now, Louis had been on Project Mac working on Muldix, where he had invented the shell. And Louis came over and determined that he, he was going to build a network in France. But while the ARPANET was a production network to do research on networks, Louis wanted to build, or, I'm sorry, it was a production network to do research on, for the, the ARPA projects, not to do research on networks. Louis was going to build a network to do research on network. They called the project Cyclod, and the switches were called Cigal, which is, of course, grasshopper in French. Their starting point in late 1971 was the first task was to determine what were the minimal assumptions that one had to make to have a basic network. Figure out what those were, and then determine what else was needed to really support everything that was going on. Okay. By mid-1972, Cyclod came together. Well, you know, and they had come up with some really new ideas. What was the minimal packet? Why assume it had to be sent on a fixed path? Route packets uh, independently. Um, and they called this a datagram. Today we call this connectionless. They also reasoned that the hosts would never trust the network to be reliable. So why go to the extra work to try and make the network perfect, which was really counter to what the phone companies were doing? The hosts would require an end-to-end -end protocol to guarantee reliability with, and with no need for the network to be perfect it would be cheaper, more resilient, and if it only had to make a best effort. They stepped back to look at the minimal requirements and found that for a data network, other than exploring congestion and routing, for now, nothing else was needed. I mean, this was a huge revelation because what they had come up with was far simpler than what everyone else was doing. And it was truly radical because it was a non-deterministic, decentralized, reliable transmission with unreliable components. And this was truly a new paradigm. Um, and that constituted a problem. OK, uh, and I don't use that word lightly. Um, this was a shift to non-determinism and to dynamic resource allocation away from what the phone companies were doing. And so just to review, in 1970, uh, you, know, you know, so the layers developed by Cyclod were as follows. So of course, there was the physical layer and the wires. The data link layer corrupted packets and made and may do flow control. The network layer did relaying and multiplexing of datagrams with primary loss due to the congestion and rare memory errors during relaying. And then the end-to-end -end transport layer provided recovery and loss due, you know, and, and uh, those errors and loss due to congestion. And of course, that implied that the loss rate at the link layer didn't the link layer didn't have to be perfect, but the loss rate had to be much less than the loss rate seen at the network layer, so that it, the transport layer would be effective. And this was pretty much their, their design. Now, in 1972, with all that coming together, Cyclod started a major program in collaboration with the University of Waterloo to ana do analysis of and simulation of routing and congestion management. Uh, it would, of course, be 14 years before the DARPA and the Internet even realized that this was such an issue. Um, then they, you know, and then, of course, they botched it pretty badly. We'll talk about that much later. Layers in the network here are not a decomposition of functions within a single system, but are distributed shared state across systems. And this was one of the things that Cyclod really figured out. Uh, and it's, it's something that's not that well known, that a layer is, you know, the most important property of a layer is its scope. Okay, 
Layer is a distributed resource allocator. Different layers have different scope. And that's what this is illustrated in this picture here. This is also why the concept of control and data planes become untenable. While it is a stack in the host, the other end of these layers are not in the same system. They aren't all in the same plane. The internet missed this uh, impor the importance of scope entirely. And it took us a long time to realize that they had, because for a lot of us, this was just natural. We, we saw this and just never brought it up. We assumed everybody got it, um, but it was only later that we began to realize they didn't. This new model had four characteristics. This was not an innocuous change, but a shift of axioms. It was a peer network of communicating equals, not a hierarchical network connecting a mainframe with terminal slaves. The approach required, as I just said, the coordination of distributed shared state at different scopes, which were treated as black boxes. There was a shift from largely deterministic to non-deterministic approaches, um, to some extent from Newton to Heisenberg, not just with datagrams and networks, but this is also the time when operating systems were making the shift from interrupt driven um, or from uh, pole to interrupt driven. And, uh, you know, and then there were also some physical layer things like the development of Ethernet about the, you know, within about two years of all this that was also non deterministic. So that, that was those ideas were just in the air. This was a computing model, too, a distributed computing model, not a telecom or datacom model. And that was really important. You know, the network was an infrastructure of a computing facility. Now, 1972 was an interesting year. First of all, Tinker Air Force Base joined the net, exposing the multi homing problem, um, at least for the Americans. Um, in the ARPANET, your host address was your imp port number. Okay, it was the interface to your the interface to the to the imp. And so, consequently, in fact, I always tell the story that when Tinker joined the net. My boss came in one day and said, "They're joining the net. They want to take us at our word. They have two connections to the network." And I said, "Oh yeah, great. Oh, that's not going to work because to the network that looks like two different hosts." But of course, half second after I said that, I said, oh, well, this is obvious. We've seen this problem before in operating systems. We need to route to the node, not to the interface. I thought that was obvious and everyone saw it. It turns out that it wasn't so obvious. Um, the ARPANET had his coming out party in 1972 at IEEE. Um, they put an imp at the conference and um, did all sorts of demonstrations. The first meeting of NWIG occurred um, at IEEE 72, where Cyclob was introduced and everyone had a great deal of interest in it. Everyone just was bowled over by Cyclob when they saw it. And, you know, the ARPANET, MPL, and others were, were involved in, in NWIG, and it was finally chartered as an IFIP working group. It was clear that the key project to develop an internet would be to develop an internet transport protocol, which was going to be key to this new approach to doing things. They also did a virtual terminal protocol, which was a big deal then, and also some more conformal description techniques. Um, and I can tell you about more about what happened at IEEE later. Now, however, this small group, and there was, you it's probably hard for you to imagine, but, you know, I would even risk to say, I mean, I know it was much less than 100 people involved in all of this. And they were new to power politics. And what we were proposing was something like the Cyclod model was very radically different from what was out there. And also very different from where some people had a large, um, shall we say, vested interest. And a nasty brawl was shaping up with the phone companies against the computer companies and everybody against IBM. Remember, 
Remember, in these days, IBM had 80 percent of the computer market. Now, but they had their problems. Um, one of the ones that somebody once told me that IBM got to where they are because they sold to the guy who signed the check. That's very smart. But think about it. In 1970, 71, uh, how much computer science do you think somebody who could sign a check for millions of dollars when a million dollars actually was worth something, you know, knew about computer science? Not much at all. And I, when I was told that, I said, you know, this is means that as the field matures and people move up the ladder, it's going to be harder and harder for IBM to make a sale because they never had the best hard, the best technical solutions. Well, you know, and of course, the dropping cost of computers, you know, just accelerated that. Program. Of course, when I said that, they all said, "Day, you're crazy. They'll never lose their place." Of course. By the mid 80s, they're laying off tens of thousands of people. But they also had a problem in networking because they had built SNA, System Network, uh, System Network Architecture, which was, as everything with IBM, centered on the mainframe. Now, of course, you know, the first rule of architecture is you can always take a higher a mesh network and subset it to be hierarchical, but you can't go the other way. And IBM knew it. They knew that this whole new approach to doing networking was the counter to what they had. Now, they were in a position because of antitrust that they couldn't really oppose it. The most they could do was try and slow it down, and which they were pretty effective at. The phone companies, on the other hand, use their architecture to determine who could define the boundary between them and the subscribers and, you know, who got to sell what. And there's another slide I could use that shows, shows that, but how they, they, two groups could have completely different views of the same equipment. Um, but this was a, but Cyclod provoked a much bigger problem for them. First of all, for the French PTT, Cyclod was a disaster. And of course, they had the PTTs had this dream that they were going to put services in the network. This became a code word. They the Minitel is, if you know about that, is a, a good example of this. But they wanted to put uh, essentially what Google and Amazon and stuff do today. They wanted to put it in the network so it would be part of their monopoly. They've never really given up on that. They keep trying to do it. Of course, having a transport layer sealed off the network to just moving the bits. And they didn't like that at all. They, they kept trying to argue that there was no need for a transport protocol because their stuff was reliable. Um, this was a big fight all through the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, um, and it was not helped by the fact that uh, Puzan was rolling around advocating against the, the PTTs. I, I've talked to the guy who was um, Puzan's boss at area, and he was getting a phone call a week saying, shut these guys down or we're going to cut your funding. Yeah. It, it was getting pretty brutal. Now, uh, you might think that, well, this isn't all that much difference. But think again, in the bees, these were two entirely different models. In what I call the beads on a string model or the ITU model, boxes and wires are dominant. Layers are merely modules in a box and hosts are not really part of the network. If you tend to draw diagrams like this, you're probably thinking in the ITU model. In the Cyclod or layered model, Processes and layers are dominant. Boxes are merely containers, and hosts are part of the network. This is a, well, puts a very different flavor on things. Now, one of the things I should have mentioned in the beginning, I didn't, was small differences here can make huge effects. And it's really interesting to see what some of those are. Um, we've already gone past three of them. Um, 
The first one actually occurred before the ARPANET got started. And I only sort of came to this much later was, it turns out that Bob Taylor, who was at ARPA, ran into Roger Scantleberry from National Physical Laboratory in England at a conference. And he happened to mention that they were planning to build, you know, that ARPA was planning to build this network. And they would have many computers for the switches and probably run 9.6 kilobit lines between the, the switches. And Roger said, well, you know, we use 9.6 in the MPL network. And we really found it was too slow. You really should go for higher bandwidth lines. Now, I don't know that Roger knew what he was suggesting, but you know, the, you know, in, in 1970, 50 kilobit lines, which is what the ARPANET had, were outrageously expensive. You know, something like $1,500 a month a mile. And, you know, having 50 kilobit lines in the MPL network, which was limited to the MPL campus versus nationwide in the in the ARPANET was a huge difference, at least in cost. However, it made the ARPANET a success. I really believe that if they had built it with 9.6, and probably none of you have ever experienced a living on 9.6, the ARPANET would have been considered, it would have worked, but it would have considered a, a curiosity, not really practical. But with 50 kilobolt lines, it was a whole new world. And I think that was a real big difference. The other thing that happened here in this, these early days from the ARPANET's point of view was the U.S. became fixated on the host as an important component of the network and, and, for, and also for naming and addressing. And to some extent, they still have never really realized that when it comes to setting up communications, the host really has nothing to do with it. The third one is a lot more interesting, and it really shows you know, how this can happen. The ARPANET assumed that the host had to be within 10 meters of a switch, okay? On the other hand, Cyclod assumed that the hosts were not co-located with the switches, and in fact, were, would be on customer premises, whereas the switches would be on the network premises, and that they would be connected by serial lines. Now, the difference between the DOD large S and what was common business practice at the time is really telling here, because the ARPANET, in the ARPANET, a host tells the imp to create a, a flow to another host, whereas in Cyclod, the host maps to a network address and establishes the connection. And also, Cyclod assumed that a host could be connected to more than one switch, okay? Now, obviously, I mean, the ARPANET did relax this constraint later on, but it, you know, but the initial idea of the host was still now very much fixed. Notice this makes the host very much part of the network, whereas over here, the transport protocol had addresses, whereas this makes the host very much part of the network, whereas the, the host is not part of the network in the ARPANET. In Cyclod, replacing the serial lines with the network was essentially did not, had no change. You add a relay on the, tra on the transport addresses, and there's really no change required. And so by that simple expedient, the ARPANET was a network, whereas Cyclod was an internet architecture in 1972 and operational in mid-73. Now back to Enwick, the group got together and they were all, you know, very much, you know, the idea of moving on something like the Cyclod ideas. And they were going to do a transport protocol as sort of the key thing. Now, there were two proposals that uh, were put forward. These are the document numbers, which they're known by. And much of this is taken from a very good article by Alex McKenzie. 
And uh, another way, NWIC 61, which is based on the Cloud Transport Protocol. And there was a healthy debate. Now, th there were a couple of sticking points, you know, and you'll see, you know, you see how fragmentation works and whether or not it was a stream or um, letters, you know, that were maintained their integrity. And these were not really major differences. I mean, compared to the forces bearing down on these guys, this this was, you know, this was not a big deal. Um, after a lot to be, hot debate, they weren't getting anywhere. A synthesis was proposed, uh, and that protocol spec was called NWIG 96, the, again, the document number. There was a vote in 1976, which approved NWIG 96. And as Alex says, MPL and Cyclod immediately said they would convert to NWIG 96. The European Informatics Network said it would deploy only NWIG 96. They were just rolling out at the time. And then he says this, but we were all shocked and amazed when Bob Kahn announced that ARPA researchers were too close to completing the implementation of the updated NWIG 39 protocol to incur the expense of switching to another design. As events proved, Kahn was wrong or had other motives. The final TCP IP specifications were written in 1980 after at least four revisions. Neither of these was totally right. The real breakthrough came two years later. After the announcement and, ARP, and ARP, DARPA was unwilling to compromise, the DARPA group goes off on their own. But the differences here weren't the most interesting thing about this event. The similarities among all three is much more interesting. This is before IP is separated from TCP. All three of the proposed transport protocols carried addresses. The TCP, early TCP, the Cyclod TS, and NWIG 96. This means that the architecture NWIG was working to was this, an internet transport protocol of greater scope with addresses over net, multiple network layers with less scope with addresses and data link layers, which might have addresses. If this doesn't hit you like a ton of bricks, you haven't been paying attention. This is not the architecture we have today. The Ingwe model was this, was this, an internet layer addressed hosts and internet gateways over several different networks with potentially different technologies, okay? With different scope, different technologies, different address, addressing. Interdomain routing was at the internet layer. Intradomain routing was at the network layer. The data link layer had the smallest scope with addresses for the devices of hosts on segments it, it connect. That was their view. The internet lost a layer. Now let's step back a minute. It was clear to everybody that the network would the networks would have to be interconnected. And there were basically two approaches proposed for doing this. The datacom approach using protocol translation and the internet approach using an overlay with no translation. Of course, as you would expect, the ITU chose a datacom approach, or actually in those days, the CCITT. Just hook them together and convert one to the other basically the same as how the PSTN works. For them, this was reasonable, you know, approach because it retained the traditional um, datacom beads in a string model and was what they were familiar with. They were interconnecting relatively similar X25 networks, so protocol translation was feasible and wouldn't be messy. With no transport protocol that would relegate them to a commodity business, it preserved their business model. So they were really, you know, gung-ho on this. The researchers, on the other hand, chose the internet working approach, build a common layer over the different networks. The upper layer required at least a minimal service from the layers below. If not, then a protocol was required to enhance the network service. 
the researchers in NWIG assumed that there would be a wide variety of potentially very, very different networks, raising the specter of messy complex translations. Here, layers are a local distributed shared state. The elements of the layer are cooperating to do resource allocation. This is a distributed computing model. Now, at the same time, while all of this was going on through in the early 70s, ARPA had created a top-notch collaborative group that had learned how to work well together. Um, the arguments that, we, that were had in the development of Telnet and FTP and stuff were, were really pretty incredible because everybody came from different systems and there was different nomenclature. But over time, we figured out that we had the same things going on. We just labeled them somewhat differently or partitioned the functions a little differently, but they had gotten really good at it. In 1973, an attempt was made to finish that work by creating the user's interest group. And they, what they wanted to do was really make the ARPANET a truly resource sharing network with protocols to really enhance that, that went really beyond remote job entry. However, and I could talk about what came out of that, some of the stuff that came out of that. But anyway, uh, fearing they were losing control, and actually, to some extent, they already had, ARPA shut down using in 1974. From then on, there is no talk of resource sharing and no new protocols developed in, for, in, in the uh, ARPANET internet environment. DARPA withdrew to just do TCP, and by 1978, has separated IP from TCP when they should have been added IP, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. With new people, mainly, with, this is, I think, very interesting because as new people started coming into the, to the net, and it was an exciting time. It was, you know, just incredible stuff going on. Um, with mainly, but the, the people coming in, the new people, you know, had telecom experiences and without the resource sharing emphasis, they saw what they were familiar with. And a comment by Jeff Houston um, just two years ago, you know, really sort of um, makes that clear. Um, you know, he, in an email discussion, he said, we originally constructed the Internet as a computer facsimile of the telephone network. When I read that, I said, the hell we did. The phone system was the anathema of what we were doing. They were the they were the opposite of what we were trying to do. So how did the internet lose a layer? Consider the network DARP uh, that the networks for DARPA's internet. You had Ethernet. You had packet radio. You had satellite network, and of course you had the ARPANET which was a real network, but it was a black box. And, you know, BBN built the net, ARPANET, BBN built the imps, BBN controlled all that. To everybody on the outside, it was just a black box. And they're building an internet. So they need an overlay across that. But the first three are not really networks. They're multi-access media. And with the common overlay, you get something like this, which should look familiar. This is basically what we have today. And there were lots of LANs connecting to each other. The ARPANET is becoming less and less important and eventually is shut off. This is not an internet. It's a beads on a string network, just like ITU. We've met the enemy and he is us. Interestingly enough, the term internet gateways drops out of use about this time, and all you hear about is routers. So the internet stayed with the data common approach. IP fragmentation is a protocol translation mechanism, not an internet mechanism. You know, it, it, to be an internet mechanism, we'd have to put everything back together as it, when it goes from network to network. By now, 1980, it's, it's starting, and by... 1980, by January 1st, 1983, it's complete. The internet is no longer an internet, but an ITU beads on a string network. The term internet gateway has fallen out of use. 
and replaced by router. We have a flat internet network. And they had help in this. IEN number 48, uh, the Catanet model uh, for internet working, had a couple of interesting quotes. Here, um, the idea that a host may have several addresses depending on how many nets it's connected to. In other words, they're continuing to name the interface. You know, Tinker Air Force Base was six years ago. They should have seen it. And the other one was to simplify translation from internet addresses to local addresses. Uh, it is advantageous, if possible, to simply concatenate a network identifier with a local host name. Addresses to create internet addresses. This turns out to be wrong. This makes the addresses path dependent, which of course, to solve moldy homing, you don't want path dependent addresses. Um, this was a really interesting result because it runs against our intuitions. You know, um, you know, we do this with file names and um, it works perfectly well. But then, you know, when I was thinking about this, you know, you just go back and think about what Multics called a file name. They call it a path name. It defines a path. And what you need with network addresses is to not define a path. You need to define where, but not how to get there. And of course, the same document, the figures are quite interesting. They all look like this. There are no layer diagrams. So what layer did they lose? It's not obvious at first. At first glance, one might say, the network layer. After all, the protocol is called IP. Removing the ARPANET removed the network layer. Everything else just dropped down. But IP addresses the interface, something in the layer below, just like the ARPANET addresses did. It's more like IP replaces ARPANET. At best, IP names a network entity of some sort. At worst, a data link entity. Actions speak louder than words. We conclude they lost the internet layer. Now, I there's a much longer lecture that goes into addressing, but you know, naming the interface that derives all this from original work by Salzer. Uh, actually, Salzer sees the problem, but then fails to to actually take advantage of it. But what we actually have here, and if you go through it carefully, what you turn out is that we, because, you know, we thought Tinker made it obvious, the first thing we have is a mapping from the application names. We're following operating systems here. We have a, a mapping from application names to network addresses. Uh, John Schock made a really, in an early paper, a really nice thing of saying applications and application names indicate what you want to talk to. Network addresses indicate where it is and rather how to get there. So the directory mapping maps application names to node addresses. The node addresses, we find that these route where it, it is and how to get there by routing in the network layer. And then unique to networking, and it doesn't really appear in computers, is that we can have we can have more than one line between next hops. And in fact, in the 80s, this was quite common. In fact, it still is. And so then we have to choose which path we take to the next to the next hop. And this is sort of what we see, you know, in, in addressing, this is how it works. Now, one of the interesting things about th this analysis is that this last mapping here and here are the same mapping. They're mappings between nearest neighbors at that level, at that layer. So, you know, that, that's really interesting. However, in the internet, all we have is point of attachment addresses, no inter as an interface, uh, which is named twice, once by the MAC address and once by the network, by the IP address. 
We don't have note addresses and we don't have application names. You know, uh, domain names are just macros for IP addresses. S sockets, I don't know if there's anybody old enough to remember this, but sockets are like jump or, you know, well-known ports are like jump points in low memory. Was that something that early operating systems did that was really ugly? And URLs are name a path to the application. Yeah, so what? This works fine so far. Really? First of all, it's limited to a very rudimentary form of client server. It may as well be SNA. It's not really any richer than that. Scaling has always been a problem. Requires a global address space. Believe it or not, that's not a requirement if in a full architecture. NATs cause much greater complexity, yet they're needed. God knows, you know, because of the, the broken arch network architecture. Can't solve multi-homing. With a full architecture, multi-homing is free. It's inherent, which also makes mobility a terrible mess. But with a full architecture, mobility is inherent. Nothing else is needed. No home agents, no foreign agents, no tunnels, no additional protocols. It just works. You can't, you can't open a connection to a specific instance of an application just to, well, you can, you can do it yourself, but the architecture doesn't support it. And you can't open a connections to specific instances of applica to applications with two different protocols. It's not supported by the architecture. Um, it's like living in the 1970s. I mean, nothing's changed. Oh, I guess I've got a question for you guys. We got this module there. And there's a need to partition it into two modules. The question is, is along what lines do we partition it? One could partition it one way but it breaks some internal functions. Or we could partition it a different way and not break anything. Which do you think we choose? Well, I, I would choose the first one. I mean, I don't know. I, it's my predilection. Then why didn't they do that for TCP? Spilling IP from TCP was a mistake. Separating error and flow control from relaying and multiplexing are independent? No, they're not. IP fragmentation doesn't work and never has. Uh, IP has to receive all of the fragments, retransmission, um, you know, et cetera. Whoops, wrong way. There is a fix, of course, in MTU discovery, the equivalent of doc. It hurts when I do this, well, then don't do it. And of course, you know, basically TCP was split the wrong way. Research into the structure of these protocols shows that they cleave quite naturally between data transfer and the feedback mechanisms of data transfer control. And it's really great because this side over here is fairly simple functions with a, um, and a very fast cycle time, and it just updates the state vector Whereas this side is more complex, has more stuff to do, reads the state vector. But other than that, these two pieces hardly ever talk to each other. Uh, this is a much cleaner separation of functionality. And um, so TCP was split in the wrong direction. And they failed to incorporate new results. Um, in, as I said before, in 1978, Dick Watson makes the remarkable discovery. The necessary and sufficient conditions for synchronization for reliable data transfer is to enforce the bounds on three times. He assumes that all connections exist all the time and always have. State vector is merely a cache of state information recently. At, I really like how he puts this. He says that all connections exist all the time, that a, the state vector we have is ones we've received data on recently. If there's no traffic for two MPL plus A plus R, we can discard the state vector. Basically, the three-way handshake has nothing to do with why this works. 
It works because the times are bounded. Now, what he is in, in the ARPANET or in the internet, a connection starts at the M plus one protocol machine and goes to the M plus one on the other side. This combines port allocation and synchronization. What Watson is saying when he assumes all connections exist all the time is that port allocation and synchronization are distinct. That first you allocate the ports, and then when there's data to send, synchronization occurs and is bound to the port IDs. Not conflating these two has significant implications. First of all, you know, we can throw away the, the synchronization after, you know, uh, there's no traffic for a while. The bindings are local. Many of the attacks on uh, TCP connection establishment do not work in this environment. Uh, it's much more secure and it's much simpler. It's more robust. And there are some interesting things we can do by assigning more than one connection to the same port IDs. They had a chance to get things back on right because in 1972, we knew that we needed something to map application names to network addresses, some kind of directory. Downloading the host file from the NIC was clearly temporary. When time came to automate, it would be a good time to introduce application names. Nope. We just automate the host file. Big step backwards with DNS. Barely is a macro is macros for IP addresses, and then there was the API. They even screwed that up in 1975 when the first Unix system was put on the net. The API was FileIO, open, close, send, receive. Notice that this would lay the groundwork for a seamless transition to application names and eliminate well-known ports. Not only that, but applications wouldn't have to be modified to use the network. Um, and this also puts the name lookup under the layer boundary where it belongs. Instead, we've got domain names and sockets, which expects, you know, too much of the internal, exposes too much of the internal machinery and requires any application to be modified. Actually, I've heard that Transitioning to IPv6 was the Microsoft was delayed by two years simply because they had to rewrite everything to deal with sockets. Then in '86 they had congestion collapse. They were caught flat-footed. Why? Everyone knew about this. They, you know, we, people have been doing research on it for 14 years, and there had been conferences on it. Now, congestion is a statistical phenomenon that occurs in any layer that relays and is contention in a point-to-point -point or multi-access layer. Load merely increases the probability that there's congestion. The effectiveness of any congestion management scheme deteriorates with increasing time to notify. Putting it in transport ma maximizes time to notify. It works by causing congestion I mean, the current solution does, maximizing retransmissions. I mean, since when do you do congestion control by causing congestion? Thwarts any efforts to do quality of service. Mean, you know, while people are trying to smooth out the traffic in the network layer, the transport layer is pulsing it. Implicit detection, i.e. lost packets, makes it predatory. Reaction to congestion in one layer you know, can't be limited to a single layer. And as near as I can tell, this makes this virtually impossible to fix. Whereas if you had an internet architecture, then clearly congestion control goes in the network layer, which is what everyone else thought. Time to notify can be bounded with less variance. Explicit congestion detection confines it its effects to the specific network and to a specific layer. Did we know better at the time? Yes, Raj Jain's work in 1988 had already shown this. Uh, he also proved that notification should begin when the average queue length is greater than or equal to one. This would make congestion and retransmissions very rare. Be good to manage the network, 
and they did a, a bang up job with uh, s and &P. I'm going to skip over this. Um, basically, the big thing here was that, first of all, s &P was probably the worst protocol they could have done. Uh, we'd already tried it in 84 and realized that it was too much overhead. And so we had moved to a more object-oriented approach with both CMIP and HEMS. However, you know, the real problem came when the s &P came out. The router vendor said, oh, you know, this would be okay for monitoring, but not for configuration because it's not secure. Well, s &P was in ASN1, which I always thought was an encryption algorithm, you know. They thought you should just open a telnet connection and send passwords into clear, which is clearly a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more secure. IPv6 still names the interface. We've known about this problem for, you know, at this point for 20 years, you know, and, you know, no multi homing implies kludges for mobility and notice the internet architecture you know, in an international issue, this is straightforward. They were actually convinced that routing on the node address wouldn't work, which just baffles me. Um, and then we had the whole debacle around that led from, you know, um, IPv7 to IPv6. And in 1992, there was more IPv7 deployed in the net than IPv6 in 2014. This was already over. By that time, IPNG, uh, by the time of IPNG, tradition trumps everything. When they can't ignore it any longer, they get post IPNG trauma and they look for workarounds. And deep thought yields loc ID split. In other words, they had the bright idea that we'd been overloading the semantics of an IP address with both locator and identifier semantics. Uh, first of all, Salser in 1977 defined resolve as in, as in resolve a name as to locate an object in a particular context given its name. In computer science, you, all names are locators. All locators do it, are identifiers. You can't do one without the other. This is a false distinction. Second, the locator is the interface, not the end of the path. We're back to the same old problem. And third, the routing research group found that the flat identifier had to be aggregatable. So this was really loc loc split. You know, I mean, this stuff was just crazy. Fourth research has looked at 15 different loc ID proposals, none of them scale. The problem isn't separating location from identity. The problem is, and always has been, separating physical location from logical location. But to do that, the layer is missing. You never get a busy signal on the internet. In 2010, they discovered buffer bloat. What a surprise. With plenty of memory of the NICs, getting huge amounts of buffer space backing up behind flow control. Well, duh, what did you think was gonna happen? You know, the stuff's got to go somewhere. If peer flow control in the protocol, it's pretty obvious one needs to have flow control across the interface as well. Actually, if they had adopted Jane's solution for congestion control, buffer bloat would never have occurred. What about security? Don't you know? Or read the papers? It's terrible. You know, this is a big problem. You know, and everything is being done after the fact. And we all know about, you know, what it means to retrofit security. What about the application layer? Well, what about it? There are applications. So what? Well, if you say so. Remember this? Remember how Claude got to, got to it? The Internet thought all error and flow control was at the edge. But that was, but you know, but that was HTLC, which does error and flow control, end to end, just different ends, right? They saw datagrams and best efforts as an end in themselves, whereas Saclod knew that datagrams and best effort were just the beginning. They were the minimal assumptions that worked for then. 
they knew that, they'd have, they, that there would be others. Taking stock, the internet has botched the protocol design, botched the architecture, botched naming and addressing in the API. When they had an opportunity to move in the right direction with application names, they didn't, they did DNS. When they had an opportunity to move in the right direction with node addresses, they didn't, they did V6. More than Bosch network management provided no direction in application layer. Bosch congestion control, so bad it probably can't be fixed. Bosch security. By my count, this makes them 0 for 10. Defies reason. I mean, what are these guys got an anti minus touch? But it's a triumph. That's what they all say. By that argument, so was DOS. But it works. You know, you point out all the technical flaws, and that's the only answer they come back with. So did DOS, still does. As long as fiber and Moore's Law stayed ahead of internet growth, there was no need to confront the mistakes or even admit that they were mistakes. Now it's catching up to us, fundamentally flawed from the start to the dead end. Every patch, and that's all we're seeing, is, is taking us further and further from where we need to be. Want to feel really bad? A recent book actually just came out in the last few weeks. Um, paints a very different picture. First companies were developed in the in the 80s were developing land products, then products to connect lands together in the workplace, then connecting lands over distances to create corporate networks. By the late 80s, corporations wanted their suppliers to own their networks. The next step would have been so many corporate networks wanting their suppliers on them, it would have been some pushback and some advent, you know, from the, the suppliers to say, hey guys, we can't be on all these different networks. We need a common network. Not only that, but the medium-sized companies, you know, couldn't afford a corporate network. So they need, you know, they needed a common network as well. So all of this was headed in the right direction. Um, you know, this was moving toward the, the NWIG model that we saw in the mid 70s. And then in the middle of all this is dumped free software and a subsidized ISP, but with a flawed architecture and lots of hype. The meddling of big government caused the entire mess. How do I know this was what would, would have happened? Because it did. It was the computer companies who were doing the OSI stuff. And they knew they'd have to accommodate different networks. And one of the things they were concerned about was what would happen if a if you had to communicate between two high quality networks over a low quality network. Well, you'd have to enhance it. And there are actually figures like this in the in the OSI reference model. So they subdivided the network layer into th into three parts. The lower part being quote the network layer, and the upper part being the internet layer. And so you end up basically back at the NWIG model. And actually, this is really confirmation that NWIG was right all the time because, and I, I was around with both of these, and there was no overlap in the two groups. So OSI has an internet architecture, and the internet has an IT-like network architecture. You just can't make things up. Just for old time's sakes, we find that OSI didn't lose a layer, had a full addressing architecture, including application names and more, still needed a directory. Uh, X500 was not the answer. Adopted Watson in TP4, making it a major advance over TCP. DEC would oppose Jane's work for congestion control. Had a reasonable API that could have been improved a little bit, but was on the right track. A security addendum and work was ongoing in the layers to do security. Major advances in the application layer and modular and recursive application layer with more to explore. So do we go back to OSI? Heavens no. Major advances since then. There's been a lot of uh, cruft stuck in, in the OSI stuff by the ITU that would all have to be removed. So now what? The search for a future internet was doomed from the start. There was no overarching plan to ensure the pieces would fit together. 
They thought it was all about requirements, which was really face saving. It, it had to be about the mistakes, they, about the flaws. Just because it doesn't work doesn't make, just because it works doesn't make it the right solution. Worse, the mistakes distorted the proposed solution. The flaws had to be fixed and fixed correctly. Otherwise, we were building on sand. Good enough is only good enough in the short term. Good enough adds complexity. And it is, and the complexity it adds is not linear. Now what? Well, that's what we'll talk about next time. Thank you again for joining us today, John. Had a great time.